Hi everyone, welcome to episode 66 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller, thanks for listening. In this episode, I talk to acid jazz and totally wired Radio Supremo, Ali Pillar, about his brand new music compilation, British Mod, Sounds of the 1960s. If you missed last week's episode, I spoke with White Lies bassist and songwriter Charles Cave about the band's fantastic new album, as I try not to fall apart. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, it would be amazing if you can subscribe and share it with your friends. If you want up-to-date music news, album reviews and interviews, then check out our main website at accessnoise.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Search for the tag at Access Noise Music. Here's Access Noise writer Daniel Lynch with a taste of what's been on the website this week. In the reviews section this week, we've been listening to the debut album from Belfast based band Winona Bleach, recorded in an abandoned factory in Portugal with Coral co founder Bill Ryder Jones. Moonsoak's 12 tracks make for a brilliant debut, bursting with infectious hooks and massive riffs. It's out now on Fierce Panda Records, and keep your eyes peeled on the site for an interview with the band. Speaking of interviews, John Clay has been chatting to Sophia and Crispin of hard rock band Starsha Lee about their new song, Resting in Murder. It was produced entirely by the band and is released on February 26th. Finally, some gig news and Natalie Imbruglia marks 25 years since her landmark album Left of the Middle with a run of shows in October. Nine Inch Nails play in Cornwall in June and Alabama 3 to the UK in March and April. All the detail, reviews and interviews are at accessnoise.com. Capturing the essence of 60s modernism throughout 100 tracks over 6 LPs and 4 CDs, British mod sounds of the 1960s takes a deep and detailed dive into the music and whole mod scene. In this interview, Eddie Pillar talks about the new compilation, the mod revival, acid jazz, DJing in Belfast and much more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Ellie Pillar. So hi Ellie, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thank you Mark, a pleasure to be here. You're one of the most well-known mods in Britain. But what I want to know first is, what music did you listen to and what did you wear before you were a mod? Well, God, um, I, before I was a mod, for about a year, I was a punk kid. I listened to the kind of more moddy side of punk, like Buzzcocks, Generation X. But I suppose my, my favourite band were very local to me. They lived in a, a commune just round the corner from where we grew up. And um, a friend of mine's brother lived in the commune. They were called Crash. And, and they were certainly probably my favourite band for, for for the year before I, I suddenly discovered uh, the mod thing, you know. So I suppose I grew up as a little punk. Oh, by the way, I absolutely love Stiff Hill Fingers and The Undertones. There you go. Yeah, great, great bands. But what, what I found it was interesting, you know, um, your mum ran the Small Faces fan club. Um, so I'm sure yeah. you would have heard their music being being played around the house when you, when you were younger. But you're obviously too young to associate uh, their music for from any movement. Absolutely right. I didn't have a clue. You know, uh, I didn't know any of that. My dad told me about the Small Faces when one day I was wearing a park uh, and he was dropping me off at school and he went, you want to ask your mum about mod, son? And I said, why? And he went, well, you heard of small faces. Of course I have. Why? Well, she did the fan club. We live next door to the, you know, the Ruskin Arms, which was the pub where the small faces started. And, um, yeah, she did the fan club, 65, 66. And you're on the front cover of Yitzhaku Park uh, sleeve. And I had... Absolutely no idea. I was gobs. I didn't even know what mods was then. I just literally put on a Parker. So I wasn't confused as a punk because by this time, I didn't want to be associated with the kids wearing Sid Vicious kind of black leather jackets, anarchist t shirts, and sniffing glue. That wasn't us. So I'd already realized I didn't want to be a punk, but I didn't really know what mods were. So when, what was the catalyst that made you become a mod? It was obviously in the mod revival. I was actually surprised to find out, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
that the mod revival started in Scotland in 1978. Is that right? Well, you know, I've written plenty of books on this. Um, do you know what? I think the mod revival started in 73 with the publication of the Who's Quadrophilia LP. And it wasn't really the LP because let's be honest, they were a rock kind of, a, not heavy metal, but they were kind of a pro rocky band. But in the middle of the Quadrophenia Gatefold Sleeve was this beautiful booklet of this kid um, in a Target T-shirt with a scooter. The whole of the Quadrophenia film is based on that booklet. And I think so many of those kids took their influences from that booklet. I didn't. I'm a little bit younger than that. But let's be honest, in 1978, we had the Buzzcocks dressing like mods and playing angular, fast, aggressive kind of mod music. We had the Jolt, which is what you're talking about, the Scottish band from um, uh, from 1977, 78, who was signed to Polydor, the same label as Paul Weller with the same producer. They were certainly one of the first ever mod bands, but you also had, you know, Generation X singing about Kathy McGowan, but you had the jam. And, and you know, if you if you follow the jam's progressive kind of career from 74, 75, Paul Weller was almost unique in wanting to live that life. And funny enough, he never wanted a mod revival. You know, he just wanted to, that's how he was. But it, it was inevitable as people started going to see the jam that they, you know, we reject the class. For example, the class were rocking the Casbah, where our bloke was talking about kidney machines playing for rockets and guns, you know? And I just felt the jam was so relevant to my generation. And they were mods, so we just copied them and we became mods. And I think, you know, the mod revival was a direct result of the jam. But that's not to downplay the role of the Jolt, who were probably the second mod about the band from Scotland that you were talking about. And I, I only saw them once, and I, I really liked them. But there were so many mod at Blondie. You know, Clem Burke, the drummer of Blondie, was a mod with targets and arrows on his drum kit in 1978. And he was more famous than Paul Weller at the time. Blondie were bigger than the Jam. So, you know, it is, there's a, a million influences for the mod revival. And we'll never really know what was first, chicken, egg, you know. But what was it that you seen? first that you went right i really you know want to be something to do i want to be in this and i want to have something to do with it well first of all um i was at a buzzcock gig and you know i was 15 wearing kind of teeny punk clothes um we used to go to gigs all the time then and you didn't need id you know you could buy beer at pubs there was no problem like there is now for kids um, and some punks just said, look at those posers, you know, what a bunch of idiots, wankers, look how they're... And I was like, oh, they're talking about us. And the real kind of thing where it happened was, I, I was coming back from a Stiff Little Fingers gig at the Electric Ballroom um, in the early months of 1979. And... In those days, you wrote on tube trains. That's you know, with a marker pen, you know, West Ham United or whatever. And I, I was writing stiff little fingers, and this bloke tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, "Can I borrow your pen?" And he wrote mods with a little arrow on the D. And I'm like, mods? What's that about? You know? And he proceeded to give me a whole kind of. You know, I, th I think in those days the. Early people that went to the Mob Revival were evangelists. They wanted you to join them in their way of life, which wasn't punk. And he was very, you know, kind in the way that he explained this scene that they were into. And they don't want to come and see this band that were playing in a couple of weeks' time called The Chords, and they'd only just started. And I just got hooked, you know. But surely at that time, because he was the first sort of mod you had seen, surely at that time in London, there, there couldn't have been too many mods around at that stage? There wasn't. It, basically, they, they were a group of disparate jam fans that started dressing like their heroes or copying the kid in the Quadrophenia book. And, you know, it was a very 
interesting to I was only probably 14, 15, but to be kind of embraced by these kids that were only a couple of years older than me, come and see our bands, come and do this. I, I just felt part of a very exclusive world um as a kid which welcomed me whereas i'd felt kind of punks coating me off of being an idiot not getting the clothes right whatever and there was none of that in the mod scene it was just come with us join our little party and i did and so did two or three of my mates at school and we were very <laughs> few in number i mean the mod scene didn't really blow up until the release of quadrophenia in august of that year of 79 and then things really took off. And who were the main bands? Obviously, you mentioned the jam. I'm sure Madness, you, you could maybe say were at least a, originally a mod band. Well, um, here's the thing. The different, there was no difference between the two-tone scene and the mod scene. They were both part of the same thing. The specials, Madness. Madness took over the residency, the mod Wednesday night residency at the Dublin Castle uh, in Camden in probably June 79. So we'd go and see the fixations for four weeks in a row, then the next mod band would be Madness, uh, you know, and they'd do four weeks in a row, and then it'd be maybe the Lambrettas. So we saw that whole thing as part of the same world. And it was only afterwards, kind of towards the end of 79, that, that Two-Tone moved off um, and became, you know, far more successful than Mob Revival. But it didn't take away from the roots you know, Rude Boys and Mods were two sides of the same coin. You know, skinheads weren't, but Rude Boys and Mods were, you know. What was, what was when you thought, right, I'm part of this here, what was your typical mod outfit for going out on a night out? That's, that's a really good question because at the beginning, we only wore Parkers and Hush Puppies. Uh, and this was purely, we were called Punks and Parkers. There's a really good documentary called Tell Us the Truth about Sham 69, which is on YouTube now. I don't know. I think it might have been ITV at the time. But it, it's made in the early months of 1979. Uh, and it features these kids like me that were changing from being kind of punks into mods. And, you know, we didn't know anything about mods whatsoever. We just adopted the look so people knew we weren't punks. And then after a while, we started... If mod is nothing else, it is attention to detail. And we started to look behind the Parker, the Desert Boots, you know, the, the Target T-shirt, the scooter, that kind of thing. And, and it, I have to say, and it sounds kind of odd now to kids, because there is no contemporary equivalent of somebody following a passion, a particular passion, a youth culture it used to be called for their whole lives. There is, you know, you can't imagine an Ed Sheeran fan, you know, dressing like Ed Sheeran and being Ed Sheeran for 40 years. You just can't see it. So it must be strange for young people to see people my age wearing the same clothes we wore when we were kids because it meant so much to us. You know, we only found out what it was about later. There hasn't been any movements in years. Probably, going, I would say, maybe going back to emos or maybe Britpop when people were dressing like, you know, Liam Gallagher. But And you still get you still do get people dressing like that now, but why do you think there is no movements anymore in music? Uh, okay, so if you look at Britain since the Second World War, there has been a constant progression of youth culture, uh, which is basically a, a teenager, a young teenager, meeting like-minded people, finding their feet in an adult world through, you know, association with people like them, that like the whether they're teddy boys, rockabillies, punk, whatever. We'd had that all the way through until 1988. And what happened in 88? Acid House. And what Acid House did was take the style element out of youth culture. You know, youth culture was always your uniform. You know, you dress like that to make you part of the crowd. With Acid House, you just wore a baggy old T-shirt, got off your tits, and, and you know, you, you were accepted within that world. But but suddenly, people like me, and I was only, what, in, in 88, 24, we suddenly felt disenfranchised, which is why we set up Acid Jazz, because we were about style, we are about black music, we are about soul, jazz, and funk. And suddenly... 
this whole thing has come and wiped out every kind of youth culture. And it also wiped out football, hooliganism, casual, you know, the whole thing. It was year zero in terms of youth culture. And Acid Jazz was very, very successful. People saw it as a kind of a reinvention of mod. Brit came along, which was also a reinvention of mod completely. You know, all those people involved in that, from Clint Boone to the Gallagher's to, to you know, uh, Charlatans, that was a complete reinvention of mod. But it was different because things became easier to be a mod in 79 to 83, 84, was hard. You had to search, you had to learn. By the time you can go into Topshop and buy a mod outfit and go and see Oasis, it's easy. There's no discovery involved, which meant that people didn't really care. It's not, you're not investing. So I, I mean, I sound like a fucking lunatic now, but it's been a constantly evolving thing since 1957 in this country. And it's still evolving now. You started your popular mod revival fanzine, Extraordinary Sensations. And how did you put that together? And, and where did you sell it? Because I suppose if you were doing that now, it would just be a website, wouldn't it really? Yeah, well, so I've written a couple of books on fanzines. The first one was called Mod Seats, about mod fanzines. The second one was about punk fanzines. But the thing was, with the outset of do-it-yourself culture, when punk happened in 76, 77, People couldn't read about their bands in the, you know, music press. They were disparaged. They would, they weren't liked. You know, journalists wanted to write about Camel, or you know, Emerson Lake and Palmer. They didn't want to write about the damn the Sex Pistols. So people like uh, Mark Perry with Snipping Glue, or Gary Crowley with the Modern World, or you know, they started to do it themselves and. By the time the mod scene came around, a little three or four years later, fanzines were the main thing. The mod scene had two or three major fanzines in 79, maximum speed, um, direction, reaction, creation, you know, three or four big fanzines. But by towards the after Quadrophenia came out, the original mods, the original people who embraced the mod revival started to walk away because suddenly there's hundreds of thousands of teenagers. So it, it, it took this thing that was regarded as exclusive and it made it very, very mainstream and very watered down. So the originators of, of the mod scene, like Maxim Speed and Buffalo Gladding, all those people, they started to walk away and it left a gap in the market because mods were disparaged by the press because they weren't Mekons, they weren't Gang of Four, they weren't the Three Johns, they weren't from Leeds and Manchester post, post-punk art rock. It was a working class movement that come from the streets with no Svengali's involved. And consequently, the music industry didn't like it. You know, I the first time I saw the Purple Hearts, I'm 15, the band are 16. You know, it's very, very difficult to be pretentious when your audience is the same age as you, you know. So we had an incredible bond, but no press would write about it. Gary Bush, who did a bit, you know, Adrian Thrills at the NME did a bit. But by 1980, mod was a dirty word. So the only place we could read about and find out about our bands was fanzines. So I was persuaded to start Extraordinary Sensation. I did, did it at school. It was crap. And then but by, you know, episode three, uh, issue three, a lot of the main fanzines had disappeared and it started getting quite successful. I mean, by, I suppose, by issue 13, no. I don't think we did the 13th. I think we went from 12 to 14, so we didn't have any bad luck. <laughs> but Terry Rawlings had joined me, and we were doing 10,000 copies an issue. Now, to staple 10,000 fanzines, you know, on your own, is a bloody pain in the ass. So in the end, about after about issue 16, we just knocked it on the head. But, you know, I'm pleased to say that people remember it as, a, as a, an important part of the mod world, you know. We sold a lot in, in, in Northern Ireland, actually. I can't remember the shop that used to take it, but we'd send them a 1,000 at a time. And they would sell them and send us the money, you know. And they're really 30p a pot. So it, we'd charge 15p wholesale, send them, ship them over there. And I, was it Caroline? I can't remember the name of the record shop. It was Caroline Music. But yeah, yeah. I mean, they sold shitloads. And 
the thing about Northern Ireland is that it was the biggest mod revival scene in the country, but not until about 82. It became enormous, and I don't know why. I've still not worked out why, but proportionately, per capita, it was the most vibey, exciting mod revival place in the country. And that's where we sold the most of our copies. And I went there to DJ many times. I, I have a love-love relationship with, with Ireland, but Northern Ireland in particular. Because in those days, people forget nobody would go there because they were scared. I read that you have an interesting story coming, traveling over in the boat over to Dublin. It has interesting stuff going on in Dub- Dublin. Then you traveled up the Cross McGlen on your way to Belfast. I got invited to DJ in Belfast at the Abercorn, which is no longer there. Um, it was quite near Europa. So I wrote to a couple of friends because you had to write. There, you know, there was no in email or anything. I wrote to a couple of friends in, in Belfast, the, the late Sean O'Gorman, who was um, part of a um, mod fanzine in, in Dublin, and um, Robbie McDonald, uh, who were from... The Emerald Society, which was a kind of a so they they said, well, if you're coming to DJ in Belfast, we'll give you a gig in Dublin. So I rode my scooter to Dublin, and one of my subscribers to Extraordinary Sensation says, "You can stay at my house, you know, on the way between Dublin and Belfast. I live halfway through." And of course, I didn't know that much about Irish politics at Easter at the time, and he lived in Crossway Glen and. You know, put it this way, it, it was an interesting weekend. I'm probably the only mod DJ to be on a Sinn Féin rally at the GPO and an IRA funeral in the Borderlands and an Orange March in Belfast. It, 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 you couldn't make it up. It was an incredible time. You know, I'm very lucky to have experienced it firsthand, but I'm also very lucky to still be here, put it that way. Uh, but have you been over since? I've been over many, many times. Um, I must have DJed. I mean, I remember once I drove the van for making time and the lock broke on the van. And so we had to leave all the equipment uh, in the van and they made me sleep in the back of the van. So nothing got robbed. But of course, where do you park a, a transit in Belfast in 1984? I know the hospital car park. That was one of the most terrifying nights of my life. But as I say, you know, the troubles, which thankfully are long gone, but they didn't seem to touch the mod world. You know, they they really didn't. And I think this is because youth culture inculcates a passion and love for something that isn't inherent in the society they grew up in. So you've got kids that are 15 years old going, I don't want to be involved in that. I just want to like the specials or dance to the chords or listen to Northern Soul. And I think the mod scene in Northern Ireland was extraordinarily successful and healthy. And I loved it. I, I've DJed there over 20 times. But the main thing we're here to talk about is your new compilation. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm rant. I'm, I'm rolling about mod, which is something I do all the time. So no, but that, that's what I wanted to know. I mean, uh, I, I was asking you the question. I wanted to know all about that, which was leading up to this, was British mod sounds of the 60s. It follows the acclaim of Ali Pillar Presents the Mod Revival through Demon Music Group. This new compilation, Ali's British Mod Sounds of the 1960s, captures the essence of 60s modernism. It's a 100-track collection, including rare and obscure material. So how, how, how do you end up doing these things? Do you ask to put these together, or is it your idea? <laughs> I get asked to do loads of kind of stuff like this. But the thing is, when because this Demon is part of the BBC, they're a big company. As a jazz, my label wouldn't be able to put a six vinyl LP box set together. I mean, it would cost too much. We'd have to license you know, We couldn't afford to license the material. So when uh, they asked me, Demon, to do the mod arrival thing, I don't think they were expecting it to be as successful as it was. So they they said, well, do you want to do a follow-up? What would you want to do? And I said, well, you know, see, the thing about mod music is it's whatever you want it to be. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's just music mods like. So, you know, mods like black American music, 
But by the time this had transferred itself to Britain, they liked music. So the reason it's called British Mod Sounds of the 60s is because it's Britain's take on black America in the 60s. And, you know, the bands can be, for example, Small Faces, The Action, The Fleur de Lee, mods, four mods in a band, five mods in a band, the high numbers, four mods in a band. It can be a band with just one mod, like the Kinks or the Hollies, you know, or, or it can be a load of session musicians that know nothing about mod, but just made a great mod record. So it was important to make people understand that it was just a British take on what became a, a very enduring um, lifestyle culture. And I'm very proud of it. It's had some absolutely amazing reviews. I'm surprised, to be honest, but it's not definitive. For example, talking of, of Northern Ireland, I got turned down for Mystic Eyes by then. Um, now, if you know that track, that features a windmilling guitarist a year before Pete Townsend started windmilling, right? So it's a very important, brilliant one track. And I got turned down. So I, I'm lucky enough to know Van and know Van's manager or ex-manager. So funny enough, I phoned Van's ex-manager and said, look, I've been turned down from this for this box set with a them track. And he went, funny enough, I'm with Van now. I said, well, can you ask him for me? And he said, uh, Van, oh, a mate of mine's doing this mob box set. Would you consider? And, and Van's answer was, is Cyril Davis on the box set? And of course, Cyril Davis, a uh, uh, blues harmonica player who was a sheet metal worker from the north, is on the box set. And when I said yes, Van went, oh, I'll do it. it. You can have it. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. But then, you know, you go through the universal, the this and that. And, and in the end, we didn't get it. Even though I had Van's personal, you can do it. So I couldn't get the Who, I couldn't get Brian Auger and Julie Driscoll, I couldn't get them. There's, so that's why there'll never be a definitive box set because you can't get all the product because, you know, they're owned by companies that had nothing to do with the companies that made the records. They just say, yes, no, yes, no. I mean, there's, there's many artists on the compilation who went on to be superstars in, in various other genres, such as David Bowie, Rod Stewart, Mark Bolan, uh, who all had their mod phases in their careers. But who, the one I was most surprised about seeing on there was Tom Jones. I sort of never associated him with mod culture. Well, funny enough, I, I've discussed this with Tom, um, and I have to say, of all the multi-million selling artists I've ever met, he is the most down-to-earth and the most approachable and the most reasonable. So, um, thing is, he his band, The Squires, uh, his first band, uh, were kind of a Valley's R&B one band, and he was the singer. And this track that's on there, Chills and Fever, is an amazing mod track. Now, Tom might not necessarily have been a mod, and that's what I was saying earlier. It doesn't have to be a mod to be on the album. You've just got to make great mod records. Children Fever is amazing. But when I discussed with Tom about mod, he knew exactly, you know, oh, my best mod track was um, looking out my window. And, you know, so there are, for example, Lemmy, Status Quo, um, Sweet. You know, they're all on there. Um, because that's where British rock came from. Tom Jones, one of the best British soul singers of all time. And he, he liked being on the album as well, or the box set. Um, you, you were saying about songs that you, you know you wanted to get on there and you couldn't, but what, what were you most pleased to get on there? What tracks? Well, the most pleased, the, the most disappointed I was, was the Rolling Stones. I wanted a blues track from the first album. I think, I think it's very important. People always say, oh, Beatles, Rolling Stones. Beatles, didn't have much to do, anything to do with mod, but they were a great band. Rolling Stones started out at those R&B blues clubs in, in Richmond, you know, and, and were very important to the development of the British R&B sound. And, and we got turned down for that, and also got turned down for the Angelou Golden Orchestra, who was, for me, the Svengali of mod, basically. Oldham, immediate records, genius, and a brilliant bloke. But what was I most happy about? I suppose that question is, what's your favourite mod band? Because, 
My favourite mob band of the action. It should be the small faces, but the action I put on uh, never ever because it's it's not often. Uh, in, you know, the action are massively underrated super band, but also the track that I love having on there, which I've had loads of criticism from, is Bus Stop by the Hollies. People say, oh, that's not a mod record. It's a mod record. Mod's whatever we want it to be. Absolutely. <laughs> As you say, yeah. Um, it's a broad church, Mark. You t- sort of touched at the start there about acid jazz. Um, so so many great artists on that label, and you're, you're still doing it now. You've had Jamiroquai and Brand New Heavies. You know, what, what inspired you to set the label up? Because you know, you'd, I know you'd been with other labels prior to Acid Jazz. Uh, I, I always wanted to work in the music industry, and I managed to get a job at an independent label called Avatar. And from there, the guys I worked with showed me how to do it. So by the time I was 19, I'd already had three different labels. I start when the prisoners split up, prisoners were like my favorite band. Prisoners split up, I saw that on the mod scene, there was a gap for an organ band. Mods loved having organ. So I persuaded James Taylor from Prisoners to make a record. John Peel loved it. It went very, very well. And I was promoting, you know, this on my label. And I met this, you know, we lived through the Acid House explosion. And I met this guy called Giles Peterson. And we were like, Acid House is great, but it's kind of a bit boring. The music's the same. So why don't we invent, think of a a way to make the kids into the acid house thing like jazz, soul and funk again. So there's a DJ called Chris Banks who came up with the name Acid Jazz. Um, Me and Giles put out some records by our friends that were hanging around with us. And Giles left after a year. But, you know, the first single, Galliano, Frederick Lies Still, so I don't know, so about 10,000 copies. Now, having worked in an independent record label, I worked at Stiff, and, you know, I had my own labels and all that. To sell 10,000 copies out the back of a van means that, you know, it's doing pretty well. So after a year, Giles didn't like the retro nature of what we were doing. He wanted to be more progressive, whereas I was quite happy making jazz, funk, and soul. So he left. And the rest is history. Jamiro Kwai, Brandy Heavis, Terry Callier, a man called Adam who turned into left field, um, Ace of Clubs who turned into MP. I mean, you couldn't really make it up. It, it, it went very, very well. And, it, it, you know, we had two albums in the top 40 last year. Um, but we don't just release Jazz Funk and Soul. We've got Matt Berry. We've got, you know, Spitfires, who look at punk, rocky, a bit like the jam. Uh, uh, it's just an independent record label, but it seems to do quite well. How do you find running the label now with the whole streaming thing going on? Well, I don't even have a Spotify account. Um, I don't have an iTunes account, you know, and I think as a jazz, here's the thing. Contemporary pop music does streaming as a jazz sells records. It's, there's no doubt it's a heritage label. I mean, we even still sell CDs, but you've got to realise that, you know, 1994, whatever, um, they said the record was dead, you know. Uh, it, it, the major labels, Philips and Sony, were arguing about the new format. Sony purchased the German company, made the lanes that cut records and destroyed all the spare parts because they wanted people to make CDs so they could resell what they'd already sold in your cupboard, you've got Jerry Ravity Baker Street. They want you to buy it again. So, you know, everyone's saying to me, why are you still putting out records? But we put out records and we were vindicated because, you know, in the last seven or eight years, records have become very important. And there's one reason for this it's because records are far superior in sound quality. And there's a specific technical reason. Um, a record, if you look under a, a record with a magnifying glass or a microscope, you see a sound wave. And the needle that goes on that sound wave plays the sound wave as it's carved into the, the vinyl. The CD plays an average. They can't make CD players 
commercial CD players or any digital format with fast enough sample rates to recreate a perfect sound wave. So what they do is they make an average and the average cuts off the top of the sound wave and the bottom of the sound wave. So when they told you these lies in 19, I don't know, 1990, the CD is perfect. You know, you'll never, first of all, it doesn't sound as good. Second of all, there is a, <laughs> there's, there's some kind of bacteria that eats the silver in between the two plastic bits of a CD. So CDs only last about 10 years. And don't get me started on the MP3s that you get on Spotify. I, they have, I'm, I'm with Neil Young and Joni Mitchell, by the way. And the, not for the same reasons they are. I'm with them because Spotify played, paid uh, some chat show host $100 million, right, to make a chat show. They played, um, they paid Meghan Markle and Prince Harry Wales $18 million pounds to make one chat show podcast. You know, we sell, we get, hundreds of thousands of streams you get paid nothing so that's the real problem with these people not that it's taken over it's they don't reward the creators of copyright eventually it's going to be too expensive for independent labels to make copyrights because nobody will buy them because you get paid 0.00 whatever from a spotify play so what's the point of investing into creating beautiful art if you're not getting paid for it it might, uh, maybe it will change, but I doubt it. I think it's it has to change. change. The, the Spotify uh, and the streaming I'm services probably, can't keep on having that model, you know, and especially with the kickback now. No, you know why they can have that model, Mark? Because they have a monopoly. Yeah. They have, whether they intended a monopoly or not, they have a monopoly. So... Where do you want to go if you don't? If you want to hear music and you don't want to go to Spotify, you don't want to go to YouTube. Where are you going to hear it? the radio? Come on. So you have to, or you buy a record. But where can you hear the records you want to buy? So I'm going to hear my radio because radio plays shit. It's a very strange situation we find ourselves in. The Brits were on recently. Well, put it this way, not my kind of thing. And I used to go to the Brits and enjoy the Brits. But I don't know anything about that kind of music anymore because I don't do auto tune. I don't like any. I just like music, and we've lost music. What, what's your What's your actual opinion of the British music scene now? Why do you think it's in such a state? Here's the thing: we're what what is called a heritage label. There's several heritage labels. What do heritage labels do? They make old sounding music for people in their thirties to their sixties. Right? If you want to hear young people's music. You know, it's auto-tuned, it's all... Do you know that Warner Brothers invented an app that writes songs on algorithms? Did you know that? So what they can do is it writes a song for you. You write your song, your nursery rhyme lyrics, off you go. That's not my world. I grew up in great rock and roll times. It's done. I don't care. I'm not interested. I'll keep putting out good music, though. Yeah, absolutely. Until I kick the bucket. <laughs> Do you know my favourite band at the moment? Rock and roll band of Fontaine's DC. Brilliant. Now, they're in their 30s, right? When I was 14 and 15 going to see The Fall and Joy Division and, you know, The Jam, they were in their teens. There's nowhere for these bands to break through. We've got six music. I don't know what it's like in Northern Ireland, but, you know, we've got six music where I worked for many years. And they do their best. But even them are getting co-opted by the few major labels that are running a monopoly. Yeah, but a lot, a lot of bands these days, there, there's more bands these days that have jobs than ever, probably. You know, they have, to, they have to go out and get a day job. I think there's always been that element of you know, waiting tables when you're trying to break through. But the fact is that how can you break through unless you have a massive, you know, management company, PL company, you know, auto-tune, pop, Dolly Bird, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, you know, to see a band like Fontaine's DC, it's very refreshing. But, you know, they should be 10 years younger 
and kids should be embracing them and taking it forward. They're not. Now, this makes me sound like a very old man who's really against the end of my world and my culture. But I can't see, you know, Britain 25 years ago was the cultural capital of the world. Do you know there isn't even a single nightclub in Soho? That's how fucked we are. Single nightclub in Soho. There's a couple of late bars, not a single nightclub in what used to be, quite recently, the cultural capital of the world. So there's no, it's done. If there's no clubs, there's no scenes going to start, and there's no music going to come from those things. No, but you can always do a pop stars programme or, a, you know, Britain's Got Talent or a fucking, you know. Now I'm starting to really sound impressive, so we should probably talk about something else. Just to finish off, because I know I've kept you quite a long time, what would be your top five mod singles? You know, could it be The Jam? Would it be The Small Faces? Could it be The Who? Could it be Spencer Davis? Or could it be, you know, Miles Davis? You know, who knows? I, I don't have, I never have a top five. Uh, I never had top ten. I just have music I love. Whether it's black music, jazz, soul, funk, R&B. And when I say R&B, I mean 60s R&B, not 90s R&B. Um, but it could be punk. Which artists are banned? Do you have the most records of? Blimey. Funny enough, that would probably be a group called the Dells on chess, um, just because they released so many records. And I have most of them. They were, they were the longest ever band that was still about, I think they lasted 48 years with the same lineup until one of them died about five years ago. But my favourite band, The Action, The Jam, Buzzcocks, yeah, that's about it. Who knows? Nice one. Well, it, it was a pleasure talking to you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. I have, you know, I tend to sound like a bit of an old grump because I am. <laughs> oh, no, right. I agree. I watched the Brits last night as well. And the only band that liked on it were uh, Will Fallis, actually, and uh, Liam Gallagher. See, I've got a lot of time for Liam Gallagher. Um I know Liam a bit, and we didn't get off on the right foot. He called me the Rod, the Mod Shrek, and I we had a, nearly had a bit of a fight. We had some bodyguards with him. Anyway, we made up, and I think he's a very funny, clever man that is making great records still. You know, yeah, and great clothes with a pretty green label. Well, he, you know, pretty, don't get pretty green. Got closed down, and he wasn't really involved in the closing down of Pretty Green and then got acquired by, you know, another company, but he's still involved. But he, I'll tell you what, he's a great bloke. Yeah. And people like him and his brother did a lot for, for my, you know, the mod world. They brought in a lot of they, people like Bradley Wiggins got into mod to Oasis, you know. Mm -hmm. And unless we attract kids to our way of life, it's going to just be dead. It'll be a dressing up society. Like the sealed knot, where you dress up like the English Civil War, you know, in in seventeenth century clothes. What do you think of the towels? Yeah, they're, they're they just uh, brought out a single there last week. I like them. I genuinely think that Ireland is is punching above its weight musically at the moment. Yeah, there's I, some I'm good liking, stuff. I'm really liking these young bands that are coming out of Ireland. Yeah, yeah, there's there, there's some great stuff. It's just the last few years, there's been just loads of great stuff coming out. Well, there's fuck all coming out of England. <laughs> well, exactly. But really good to talk to you, and I'm sorry if I went on too long, but I've enjoyed it, so thank no you. No problem. Nice one. Have a good night, Ali. Take care. Take thank it easy. Bye-bye.